There it is. <laughs> well, good to be back up here. <laughs> Been a long time. <clears throat> well, sir, uh, good morning. Thank you. That was good. Scripture reading here today is Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But any, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with great crash. So be it. Can you hear me? Okay. That means my mic's on or I'm just loud. Which one? A little of each. Let's open with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are God worthy of all of our praise, glory, and honor. And so many times we don't even have a clue of what that means, Lord. As we read through your scriptures through the Old Testament and as we read through the New Testament, we see this holy standard that we need to be and we see how filthy we are, Lord, how unclean we are, how unworthy we are, but yet you are so faithful and kind and loving and merciful and everything else, Father. Help us not to, cons to take for granted this great salvation that we have, but to realize that we have been saved, that we have been cleansed, we've been justified and sanctified with the blood of Jesus Christ, to live a life that brings glory and honor to you, a life that is something we cannot live but you will live through us as we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Jesus. Lord, help us to realize that this life is about glorifying you and fishing for others until we meet Jesus face to face. Open our ears to hear your scriptures, Lord, and apply them to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I entitled this Building Your Life, and you saw from the scriptures that Merle read, that's the last scriptures in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And if you ever built something of anything, whether it's a table or a house or whatever, you build it for its intended use, right? You didn't build it to not use it. You didn't build it for it not to work. You didn't build a table lopsided where things would fall off of it. You surely don't build a house that the first time that a storm comes along, it's going to be destroyed, Are you? do you? Where would you live? What would you do? Why would you build something like that? Why would you build something that's going to be a waste why wouldn't you build your life firmly on the words of Jesus Christ? What he has said, what he has done, the power that he has given you by not abandoning you, but by leaving you so that the Holy Spirit could come and reside inside of you, so that you could be a kingdom of priests in this world. This week you should have read 1 Kings chapter 6, verse, chapter 6 through chapter 20. You should have read Matthew chapter 7 through 10. And there were some good devotions in there. You also read some of Ruth while we were going through that and saw um, some things there pointing to Jesus. If you're reading, looking through the lens of Jesus Christ, it is so amazing how the Old Testament will speak to you. You don't see a God that is a wrathful, vengeful God. You see a God that is so faithful, so kind, so loving. And you see a people who are stiff-necked and rebellious over and over and over again. But yet God's blessings still hold true. His covenant promises are still true. Most people would say that Solomon started his reign off well. I'm not going to debate that because there's some things even in his starting that I kind of scratch my head at. And in, in, and in David telling him as he passed the crown to him some things to do. So I scratch my head. But in overall sense you say that Solomon started off his reign as king well. And the job of a king is to rule over and govern his people, which we've got to take all the way back to Genesis, where we're to rule over this world that God has given us, to be good stewards. 
and he's supposed to fight injustice and bring about the, the lack of oppression and things like that in this world. So are we doing that as Christians? Are we doing that as a church? Well, somewhere along the way, Solomon got sidetracked, and we've already read Proverbs and everything and saw the wisdom that he came to in Ecclesiastes, where he said, if you chase after the things under the S-U-N, it's just meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. But the, the, the answer to all this is the fear of the Lord, the knowledge of the fear of the Lord, and living a life that brings glory and, and honor to Him. But along that path, life's path, Solomon turned away a lot. And he was enticed by his fleshly desires. How about you and I? Are we walking in step with the Spirit? Or are we still yielding into those fleshly desires? What are they? Do you take time to sit down and think about what they are? Because it's easy to point my finger at other people and say what their fleshly desires are, but what are mine? What are yours? And are we walking in step with the Spirit, overcoming them so that the things of this world are foreign, so that we realize as we walk, walk through this life, whether it's in the wilderness or on the mountaintop high, that this is not our home. We're to live as aliens and foreigners, bringing glory to God and telling about people along the way because we're fishers of men, guys. That's what we are. We're called out from the life that we were to live a life where we fish for men and bring glory and honor to God, living a life set apart from this world but still a part of this world. And it's so easy to get complacent and lost in this world that we live in today and lose sight of that and just go about our lives living life, but not living life as children in the kingdom. Solomon turned away from God even with all the wisdom that he had, but at least he realized it and we have some of his works to read. You might want to go back and read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and so forth. I asked you before and I'll ask you again, how many children left Egypt and said, we're not going to enter in the promised land, guys. We're going to die in the wilderness along the way. No one said that. But I ask you again as Christians and as a church, are we all going to meet on the other side? Or are some of us going to fall along the way? We're here to be a part of the body to uphold each other, to lift each other up. If you're an arm and you're an arm and you're a leg, we're to work together obeying the head so that we can function properly and go about this life bringing glory and honor to God, advancing the kingdom. Do you think Solomon would have ever, Solomon would have ever said, he prayed to the Lord in the beginning to establish his covenant forever and ever, do you think he would have said his kingdom would have been divided after his death and start to crumble? And that later Israel would be taken into captivity? Do you think he would have ever had those thoughts? No, he said, I'm going to follow the Lord just like the children of Israel did. I'm going to follow the Lord with all my heart. So I ask you again today, are you following the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all of your strength? If you're not, then today's the day to get on your knees and ask forgiveness and turn to God. The scriptures are clear over and over and over again. God gives time for his people to repent because he loves them so unconditionally, so faithfully. He loves them so much that he would give his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for their sins. And not to leave them as orphans, but to empower them to live as a child of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. 1 Kings chapter 6, Solomon builds the Lord's temple. 1 Kings chapter 7, Solomon builds his palace and finishes the temple. Scratch my head again a little bit on the time and effort that he spent on his own temple, but we won't go there today. It's, that's not a sermon for today. 1 Kings chapter 8, the temple is finished being furnished, and there's a beautiful prayer of dedication. Solomon is off to a good start, and God has promised him that if he is faithful, that his kingdom will stand. Well, you've continued to read, I hope, and you know what happened in, in the years that Solomon advanced. And one of the first things he does is he makes an allegiance with the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Wait a minute. I mean, you've got to say at least wait a minute there. This is the land where we came out of and everything, and we're making allegiance back with Egypt. Can we not let this world go? Can we not suffer as Jesus suffered? Can we not be wronged and just turn our cheek the other way? Or even turn our cheek so that your other cheek can get slapped? Can you not do that? Jesus went silently before his accusers, was whipped, beat, mocked, spat upon, and crucified. Can you not take a little bit of injustice in this world to bring about justice? And he marrows Pharaoh's daughter. First Kings chapter 3, I'm going to go back for a minute. 
Verse 1, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Now, that means that they just weren't sacrificing yet in the temple like they're supposed to be. But nothing said here about this alliance with Pharaoh. Maybe, maybe his intentions were all good, but when we wander and look off the path, how easy could it be to be distracted and come off the path? Just a question that I have. As we read on 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4, The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, As for whatever you want me to give you, Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in, in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your ser servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Oh, I get some answers as I read on. Solomon didn't necessarily think it was wrong. He didn't have the wisdom to understand that it was wrong. And I'm putting words in my own thoughts. Don't, you don't have to agree with them. Because his heart was so childlike, focused on, I just want to love God and serve Him. Because children make a lot of mistakes along the way. But when you start to mature and you realize the mistakes you made, you don't make them anymore. And when you realize there are sin, you repent and turn from that, don't you? But there's many things I can think of when I did as a child, and they were childish ways. They were foolish. And he prayed for wisdom here so that he could grow in strength and stamina in how to lead his people in character, in justice, things of the kingdom of God, because he was a king over the children of Israel, teaching them how to live differently than the world around them, proclaiming the God of Israel to the heathen nations so that they might be converted, not destroyed, so that they might come in. Look at how Boaz received Ruth. She was a Moabite woman, but look at the kindness that he gave her. She was a widow. She was poor. All these things we would want to <coughs> point our fingers at in the world today. But he received her in at his table. Solomon prayed for wisdom because he only had child like wisdom at this time but he had childlike faith also didn't he and that's what God can use and what God can mold if we'll let him so where are your heart's desires do you have those childlike desires and you just need to grow up in your maturity and faith or do you even have those desires at all anymore have you passed them by and you, you just live life now and your desires or your family or your job or whatever it is or your, or your desires that the kingdom of heaven advance is your desires that your Father's will in heaven be done here on earth? Is it your desire that you, you'll be satisfied with just daily bread? Oh yeah, we should have read those words, right? 1 Kings chapter 9, God will be faithful to His covenant, but will the king? Will you? 1 <clears throat> Kings chapter 10, the splendor of Solomon. We see his riches, his wisdom, his power, the kingdom of Israel, and the world sees it. Read some of the New Testament responses here. The queen of Sheba comes to, to see what's going on and is amazed of his wisdom, knows that his wisdom is far beyond that of a mortal man, that it comes from God, something she's never seen before because her pagan gods cannot do that. They can't, well, as much as you call on, they can never start the fires on the, the altar that's been built there. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Just a little bit. We'll get there in a minute with Elijah. They cannot answer you. They cannot be there for you. But God is always there for you. He'll never forsake you. You're his child by the fact that he created you and you're a reborn child to live for him and to spend eternity with him rather than face his wrath and his judgment. But it's a slow fade. 
That's what Solomon did. And I thought about playing a video here, but I decided just to read you some lyrics instead. There's a Casting Crown song that I like. It's called Slow Fade. The reason I didn't play the video is because most of the video is about a husband or a father in the relationship today, and we definitely need to understand those things. But it's a slow fade, period, if you don't fix your eyes on Jesus, if you don't realize the promised land that you're going to, if you don't realize the holy standard that God has kept you up to, if you don't realize that your life is not your own, it was bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second glance that ties your hands as darkness pulls the strings. Be careful, little feet, where you go, for it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices are made. A price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. Solomon did start out well because he had a heart for God. He might have had some misdirected motives in what he did, but he had a heart for God so that he could rule his people, fight oppression, bring about worship, all these things so that they would know they were God's children set apart to be holy in this world. And he failed at it because of the lust that he had in his heart, because he did not take the pagan gods out. He even started building pagan altars in his lifetime. What in the world happened to him? Have you ever got to the point in your life where you look back and said, how did I get here? Because you're so far off the way, the truth, and the life. I have. If you haven't, you better dig back and think about it. When you thought that this was right in God's eyes, how about when you just judge that person and said, oh, oh, oh. But you know that it says not to judge. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughters, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites. Funny that it starts out with the Moabites because that's what Ruth was. She came out of that land because of Naomi's witness to her and because of Boaz's love to her. Seal that even more, that, that the only God was the God of Israel. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in his love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wife turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. As the heart of David his father had been, he followed Ashereth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father has done. Would he have entered the promised land if we went back 400 years? Or would he have died in the wilderness? Hmm, just a thought. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Ch Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Am Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives. How many did he have? Oh, wow. Okay. And he did the same for all of them who burned incense and offered sacrifice to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's commands. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, this is your heart's desire, this is what you want, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you. This is chapter 11. Chapter 3 is where we started. That's not far in this story of kings. And I will give it to your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out from the hand... I will tear it out from the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but I will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Now, I don't know if your thought went here, but mine did when I was reading this again, is the promises of God to the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. Because David was a righteous man whose heart chased after God. 
Oh, but yet I read about all the sin David did, but when he did sin and he realized it, he said, to you, O Lord, have I sinned, and he turned from his ways. He had this, they had, sin has its consequences. But he repented and turned to God and was a man after God's own heart. Wow. And God was faithful to his covenants, even though Solomon would be so treacherous in the way that he served other gods. So I think back to my motto verse, Hebrews eleven seven. 7, out of holy fear, I'm going to build that ark to save my family. If that's the one thing that I can do in this lifetime, I am going to keep my eyes focused on Jesus so that I live a life that brings enough witness and enough testimony, no matter what the cost, that Jacob is saved, that Michaela follows, that, that um, Kira, Isaac, Isabella, and Ezekiel follow, and whoever comes past that, I've got to put my faith there. Because I want to see them in glory. They are my heritage. They're what the Lord has given me. So I've got to have faith. I've got to have faith that the testimony that, that I gave to the children in the youth group didn't fall on deaf ears, but in time they'll come. And the same thing here and the same thing with everyone that I meet that I proclaim Jesus Christ to. I've got to keep building that ark. So when the floods come, they don't have to worry about the house that's here. They have to worry about entering the house there and hopefully they're anchored in Jesus Christ. 1 Kings chapter 12 through 16 is the history of the kings of Israel. It's not the history, his story that God intended, but it is mankind's history, isn't it? It could have been different. How are you living your story? How will history tell his story through you? There were a lot more bad kings, evil kings, than there were good kings. They did not teach their children to obey. And what happens to their children in the future? They go into captivity again, don't they? And we get up to the point of the most unholy king of them all, King Ahab, right? But at the same time, the holy man comes into the scene, doesn't it? Elijah comes into the story. 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. A man of faith enters at a time that there is time in the wilderness, that there's a time in famine, a time that it seems like God is not there, but God is there, and he's trying to speak to you in the wilderness if you'll just be quiet and listen to him and let him provide for you instead of trying to provide for yourself. He's trying to speak to you. Solomon heard his voice audibly twice, but didn't really listen, did he? Are you listening for that still, small whisper? <clears throat> We must trust our God, our God, and we have Jesus to fix our eyes upon. So we know no matter what gets thrown at us, we know that we're God's child. It's ironic that Elijah is fed bread and water from a widow that has nothing to offer. But maybe her last two mites, right? She didn't have enough to feed her son, but she goes ahead and gives bread and water to Elijah and they continue to have bread and water and continue to have bread and water and continue to have bread and water. Do you know the bread of life? Do you have living water? Are you nourishing off of Jesus so that you can feed others? But then a woman's son dies even. And Elijah prays, from the de prays to God and we realize that God has power even over death, don't we? Because a woman's son is raised back to life. Boy, it's time to sit down and think what Jesus Christ has done for me. 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah had just been there. He saw the power of God. But yet this woman can make him run away, can't she? 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do, do not make your life that one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. We just went up to Mount Carmel. We saw that the pagan gods could not be called upon no matter how much and that God even no matter how much water you put on it to dilute it oh yeah I'm thinking of salt in this world and how you can be diluted too my mind just goes all over scripture 
No matter how much you dilute it or anything else, God can not only take your sacrifice, burn it up completely what you do, present it to Him wholly, that He hears your prayers, all of these things, and He'll even lap up all the water around so you're not diluted anymore. If you'll just let Him. And He will destroy all the pagan gods and the ones that follow them if you'll live like you're supposed to live and fix your eyes on Jesus. But then why do we get scared so easily? And why do we turn our tail and run the other direction? And don't tell me you haven't done that either. <laughs> you went through this thing in your life and then you get another little thing that comes behind it and then that gets you down again. Say, why, Lord, why me? I can't deal with this. Yes, you can. Because Christ dealt with all of it so that you could live that you could enjoy life abundantly so that you could have peace that surpasses all understanding, that your joy might be complete. Hmm. So he ran into the wilderness again, but this time he lay down to die. And when he fell asleep, an angel came to him, didn't he? And offered him bread and water. Fell back asleep again, and the angel woke him up again and gave him bread and water. And he told him to eat because of the strength that he needed to build up for the journey that was ahead of him. Because he was headed to the Mount of God, to Mount Sinai. Are you headed there? Oh, now I'm into Hebrews. I won't go all over the scripture there. But I'm thinking that we've come not to a mountain that trembled and, and smoked as the commandments were given, but we can come to God holy and unashamed because the commandments are written on our new hearts. Hmm. When he reached the mountain, he went into a cave even again. He <laughs> can't hide from God. God called him out and told him that he was not alone and that even though he wanted to die, he would bring about Elisha into the mix. He would train up someone else to follow after him. All you've got to do is live the life that God has marked out for you with glory and honor. And the legacy will continue on. Maybe it won't be with your son or your grandson, but it will come. Maybe it will be with another child that you didn't even know was your child, but came along and became a follower of Jesus Christ because of your testimony, because of your witness. And therefore, they are your child in the faith. God asked him, what are you doing here? 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was there, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. A second time, God called out to him and said, What are you doing here? God told, Elisha that, told Elijah that Elisha would soon be taking his place, and there was more work to be done. Because the harvest is great, but the workers are few, right? I think Jesus says that later. 1 Kings chapter 20, Elijah repents and turns to God. But will these kings of Israel, that's where you left off in the story, are you trying to find that burning bush or are you just listening for the small whisper? Do you realize that you've already come to the Mount of God because of Jesus Christ? Do you realize that you have all the power inside of you to live because God's words are written on your heart? That you realize even when you don't have the words to say, Scripture says that God will speak through you. Are you living then to advance the kingdom of God and bring Him glory? Several hundred years have passed. You didn't get to read the history of the judges and so forth, but hopefully you know those things. And that we were, had leaders that were leading us, prophets, whatever, whatever you want to say, men of God, to keep us on the right path. Because so easily we get turned off of that path. So you come into church and that's great, but how much time are you spending outside of church reading and studying God's Word? Are you doing other things as far as Bible study? Are you helping other people? Are you being a part of the body of Christ? And then are you going out into ministry, into mission, into serving, whatever it might be, to advance the kingdom of God? Or are you just 
living, existing, thinking about that this is what life is all about when this is meaningless, 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 unless you're chasing after the S-O-N. Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus and daily denying yourself, taking up your cross and following after him? I remember my wedding day. That's one of the things I remember from the past. 37 years ago, I think. I may be wrong on that. Don't quote me. I have to do the math each time. And I remember that day still vividly. I don't remember the day of my salvation because I grew up in a Christian home. It was something that I did every day. I don't know exactly when I did. My mom can probably tell you when she thinks that I did. and you know, Probably that memory's in her heart. But I remember my wedding day, and this is where I'm going with this. Because it's something I chose to do, something that meant so much to me, and I made a commitment. And on the hillside, I told Sherry, crying. Yeah, I cry sometimes, right? Right, John? I put what John said of Merle. And I said, because of the commitment that I was making, I said, don't you ever leave me. I wasn't worried about the things we were going to go through, anything else at that point. I just made a commitment that I was going to spend my life with her. Now, let's fast forward 37 years. There's been some good times and some bad times. I'm glad she's not in here right now. <laughs> some hard times, some good times, some learning times. But we're still committed. We're still together because we made a commitment because we had a love that we shared. Now, you know, maybe her love will grow cold. Maybe mine even will. I don't think so because we made that covenant with God also. And that's what's held us through those times. But how can you say, her love for me was great, that's what drew me to her. But how can you ever think that God's love for you is not so much greater? He gave his only son to die for you so that you would be his forever. So whatever you're facing in your life, Whatever sins it's easily entangled, whatever things are, are hindering you or anything else, throw them away because they're meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. All that matters is God's love for you and you living a life that glorifies Him. Because one day you're going to get to meet Him face to face. And Scripture says that not only are you going to get to meet Him, but you're going to be held accountable for every idle thought, word, action, everything. Because your life was bought. It does not belong to you. Maybe you haven't experienced that wedding day. Or maybe you need to go back to that wedding day and, and realize what you committed to. Because God hasn't changed at all. And you can't look back at history of Solomon or Elijah or anybody else and say there wasn't times when they didn't understand their relationship with God fully. So they walked away from him. They did things evil in his sight. But you know, none of those Old Testament saints, Hebrews tells us that again, none of those had... Jesus living inside of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says this to that church that struggled with that in their day of Jesus, or slightly after Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 2 to 6, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be uh, towards some people who think that we live by the standard, standards of this world. They never wanted to leave the world. They wanted to be a part of the world and a part of the church, part of God at the same time, and you can't do that. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your um, obedience is complete. Did you listen to that? They, the church, thought that they should live by the standards of the world. Are you still living by the standards of this world? I, and that's tough. I know that's tough because do you stay in the job you're at? Do you stay this? What are you, what are you calling me to, Lord? Well, he's placed you where you're at, so don't try to just change those circumstances. But how can you be a light and an example, and what can you do where you're at? I don't know. Take that to the Lord and ask him. But where is your heart? Where is your motivation? Because we wage war. 
You do whether you're in the world or you're set apart from the world. You wage a spiritual battle. You're either with King Jesus or you're with, it, with King Satan. You're either with Jesus and gathering or you're against him and scattering. There is no gray. It's black and white. When it turns to gray, we have a problem, don't we? And what we have, the weapons that we have to fight this war, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. They'll take captive every thought to make us obedient to Christ. And your obedience should get to the point it's complete. You should be growing, maturing, realizing that it's just like your wedding day, that you're madly in love with the one who was so madly in love with you. They said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. James had a right to the church also in James 4. Verse 4, you adulterous people... Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason, you just read it and hear it, but don't do it, that he jealously longs for the spirit he has called to dwell in us? Wow. The spirit that dwells in us 24-7 because we are God's child, that we can worship in spirit and truth. But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So therefore submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You were washed, you were sanctified, set apart to be God's child in this world. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Last, the week before last, you read the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Sounds like we just read that again, didn't it? Blessed are those who... Colossians, another church. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 through 13, Paul writes, So then, just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthening... Strengthen in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than of Christ. Oh, such similar words of James to a different church from a diff different author. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were raised with Him through your faith in the working of God, you raised Him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ." He forgave all your sins. Do you remember that wedding day? Are you still living as if that day was today? How about tomorrow? Will you live as it's your wedding day tomorrow? And the next day? And the next day? And the next day? So have you answered Jesus' call? In the scripture we read, you, you read the call of Matthew, where he told him to get up from that tax collector's booth and follow after him. A little different than the call of Peter and Andrew. They were fishermen. They had to leave their father behind. That was tough. But you know, when you fish, one day you catch fish, one day you don't, right? It's part of the business. One day you've got plenty to eat, one day you don't. Matthew, on the other hand, he worked for that other kingdom. The kingdom of Caesar, the, the ones that the, that the disciples thought even when Jesus was ascending into heaven and at that time he was going to destroy that and, and take over and reign. But he did, they didn't realize that Jesus had already destroyed it. And we're supposed to usher in the kingdom of heaven by the way we live, by what we do. Matthew got up from his tax collector's booth from his security because he didn't have to worry about day in, day out. One thing is for certain, death and taxes, right? <laughs> and he could take and say, you owe this much. You owe this much. And because I need a new boat, give me this much instead. He didn't have to worry about daily bread whatsoever and he walked away from the kingdom of this world and what that could mean to for him coming after him and him losing his life 
to worry about where his daily bread would come from following Jesus because he saw the truth. So you're reading his gospel, his story of what the good news meant to him. Don't forget about our devotions, though. I want to throw that in there before I go to Matthew. Several of your devotions talked about Ruth, like I said, who left the land of Israel to go into a foreign land because there was a famine, what seemed right at the time. She came back with her mother-in-law as a widow, as a, as a pauper, to a foreign land, back to the land that was the land that Naomi should have stayed in all along. Okay, But we make these choices during, during our life. And she comes back and humbles herself and starts to glean from a field where we're supposed to give to the poor regardless of circumstance. Another sermon for another day. And was accepted and brought into the table of Boaz and becomes part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Wow. Ruth chapter 2 verse 14. At mealtime Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine. If scriptures don't point to Jesus, you're not reading them. <laughs> you don't understand them. She then sat down with the harvesters. She offered, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Whenever you're faced, whatever it is in your, in your life, God will give you what you need and you will have plenty left over, just like the fishes and the loaves. He will never run out of giving you what you need, but will you walk in faith? James chapter 2, verse, six, verse, uh, verse 5, excuse me. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love Him. Sounds like part of the Beatitudes again. Verse 11. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. So what does that mean? Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Okay, so you finished Matthew chapter 7 through 10. You finished the Sermon on the Mount. You saw the faith that healed many. You got a glimpse of following after Jesus. Did you listen? Are you following? Peter and Andrew left their parents, their family business, security of somewhat, followed after Jesus. Didn't longingly look back, didn't understand everything at this point. Matthew, whom the gospel is written from through his perspective and the, and the Holy Spirit, of course, left the tax collector's booth behind to really have to know what daily bread meant, to fear real persecution of death, to not have the comfortable things in life, but instead would follow after Jesus. During that reading, you should have read some words from Jesus about following him. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. You also should have read, Take heart, sons, your sins are forgiven. You remember that? That's based off the faith of someone else bringing them to Jesus. You also should have read, For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, when the Pharisees condemned him for healing. You also should have read, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Are you working for the kingdom? Chapter 10, Jesus sends them out to fish for men because the harvest is coming. It's coming. It's a day closer today than it was yesterday. It's coming. It's in a world that looks like it's coming at any moment. It's coming. Are you working? Don't think it'll be easy. Chapter 10, verse 37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Verse 39. For whoever finds their life, and you could put soul in, soul 
in there, they will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it now and forevermore. How many Christians do you think will say that I'll be there and see you in glory that won't be? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I'll look at Matthew chapter 5. I'm going back to the week before. So I have to dig back a little deeper. I have a problem remembering yesterday, so we've got to go back a little further. Blessed. All right, wait, let's start first. Jesus has done his ministry for a few years. He's kind of famous. There are many people out there in this world wondering, who is this Jesus? But the real question is, not who is this Jesus to the world, it's who this Jesus is to me. Because it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks, it matters to me. Once it matters to me, it does matter that the rest of the world, because then I'm going to fish for men, because Jesus is going to teach me to do that. But before I come to that call, I've got to answer who Jesus is to me. There are the crowds, and then there are the disciples. And if anyone wants to be my disciple, you don't have to make that decision, but if you make that decision, you realize that Jesus is who he says he is, and you make the commitment to follow him. If you don't make the commitment to follow him, then you didn't realize who he was. Okay? Dangerous place to be. If Jesus is Lord of your life, if you profess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord, then you will be saved. Okay? So they gather on a hillside and there are crowds and Jesus sits down to teach his disciples. The rest of the crowd is there. They're going to hear, just like in John chapter 6, if you want to go read that, when Jesus has to say to many of them and even this, he, many of his disciples turn away. He says, you're only here for what you can get out of this. But he sits down and starts to teach them this counter-cultural way that the kingdom of heaven is to look on and in the kingdom of earth. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's now. Blessed. What does blessed mean? It means extremely happy. Yes, it does. But it means that you're extremely happy because you're in right standing with God because your sins are forgiven. You are His child. Okay? You can't be blessed otherwise. You might have some blessings in this world, but you can't be blessed that this verb is telling you here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. Blessed is who? Break it down simply. The poor in spirit. Not flesh, but spirit. Those who realize that they are spiritual beings in a physical body and say that there is no way that my soul will spend an eternity in heaven because I am a rotten scoundrel sinner. I do not deserve God's grace, but he gives it freely to me. There is nothing I can do, no works of righteousness, anything else. I have to be bankrupt in my spirit and say there is no way that I can pay my debt. Because when I realize that, the kingdom of heaven is at my hand. Blessed are those who mourn, not because they mourn because things are bad in this world, but mourn because this world is still ruled by sin. And you do something about it. Because when you mourn about something, you get up and do something about it. You don't sit there in your pity. You go do something about the injustice that's in this world, about people dying, especially people you know that you love, even your enemies that are dying and going to hell because they don't know Jesus Christ. So you do something about it, and you find comfort in it, and you bring comfort to others. 1 Corinthians tells us, or 2 Corinthians, I think it is, says that the God of all comfort comes to you so that you can comfort others. Third one is blessed are the meek. No, Jesus was not a sissy. Jesus was meek. He didn't have to open his mouth to prove his point. He didn't have to call down a legion of angels to take him off that cross. He willingly laid down his life for the joy of the cross set before him. He was meek, kind, considerate, didn't turn another word. Oh, I'd have a tough time dealing with that one because I'd want to be like, why in the world are you doing this to me when I've done no, nothing wrong? I had a problem with that one. But as I work with that one, and you'll see this is a progression, that I'll inherit the earth. The things of this earth won't matter as much to me. I'll be able to walk through this world and not worry about somebody slapping me on one cheek. I'll turn the other. I won't have to worry about my enemy saying, give me your shirt. I'll say, would you like the jacket too? I don't need it. God will give me one. I won't have to worry about the guy that I go see on the corner with a sign up that says, I need money for food because I won't care why he needs money. 
I will care about bringing him the gospel message and helping him however we can. We can be wise about that, but I certainly don't want to say in my heart, I'm not going to help that guy. Who am I to point fingers? Blessed are those in their hunger and thirst for righteousness instead. They seek out God's word every day. They hunger for it. Not just, I'm hungry because I hadn't eaten today, but I'm hungry because I haven't eaten for days and days and days and do not know where my next meal is coming from. That's hunger. And I'm so parched that I can't hardly speak because my throat and tongue are so dry I can't speak. And I hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness. For right living in this world. For being holy and living holy lives. For they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy, merciful. Those who hand out God's grace, which is His undeserved merit or favor, on those who least deserve it. That's mercy. You've done this to me. I'm not going to point at you. <laughs> You've done this to me, but I give you this instead. And I don't do it with any animosity or hatred or anything else because God was merciful to me, a sinner. How in the world could I not be merciful to anyone else? They will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. And we're working through this as a progression. Because once I've learned to give mercy to someone who doesn't deserve it, the more my heart is like Jesus. And therefore, I will see God because I see Jesus. And I see Jesus living through you when you get to that point or are at that point or whatever. I see the kingdom of heaven coming to the kingdom of earth. I see Jesus reigning through his people. I see lives being saved. I see revival. So then I progress to this next one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This doesn't mean living in peace so much. It's a peacemaker. And to establish peace, you have to go through some hard times to get to peace. Because we are all on broken relationships. So I have to go into the family member that I despise that did this to me. And I have to mourn because that person is ate up in their grief and everything. I have to be meek in how I do it and present the gospel with gracefulness and with, with meekness. I have to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness so that I can see him bring about this feeling in my life and the life of who I'm showing mercy, mercy to because I received mercy because it comes from a pure heart and I see God. So I have to do this and it may not be easy and it may take a lot of time and it may take a lot of sacrifices but because I do that I am being a peacemaker and I will be called a child of God. Do you see the progression? Blessed are those who are persecuted then, yes, because of righteousness, because they hunger and thirst for it, and because they do something about it, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We got right back to where we started when we first met Jesus face to face. Because we realize what he's teaching us. Verse 1 said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10 said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You have no doubt in your mind that you are a child of God. You belong to him. Nothing can separate you from him. But do you live like that in the world? I didn't say you had to every day. I didn't say you didn't fight a spiritual battle. But are you progressing like that? Can others see Jesus Christ in you? Is this world fading away and the kingdom of heaven coming in your viewpoint because you want to bring about God's righteousness and justice and bring others to salvation? Or are you still living somewhere with some demons along the way, some hatred along the way, some guilt along the way, whatever it is? Or maybe just your eyes focused back on Egypt. Blessed are you when, you when people insult you, persecute you falsely, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven then. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, and we just read about Elijah, so we know what he, he bowed and faced. You are the salt of the earth. Okay, because I see all these things and I'm living this way, here's what I'm supposed to be. Salt and light. Salt that is a preservative Salt that is a flavoring. Salt that will not break its chemical properties down unless it's diluted. That's how to get rid of salt is by diluting it where it's not as salty. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It can't physically, but thank goodness it can spiritually again. God can even do that. 
It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. I'm going to keep building my ark. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your God which is in heaven. Back to what Merle read this morning at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, wait a minute. We got all those things in between, don't we? That love the enemy stuff, especially. Do you see where that fits in the Beatitudes, where that enemy doesn't matter anymore what he did? What matters more is God's righteousness and his salvation and the fact that he knows Jesus Christ and I am his ambassador in this world? So how could I hold a grudge? How could I be the gates of hell trying to prevail against the kingdom of God coming in? How could I be that way? Forgive me, Father. Take that from me. Help me to have a love of Jesus in my heart so that I may see Him in my life and in this world. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. Oh, if Solomon had thought of this first. Hmm. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now Merle stopped there, but Matthew 7 has the rest of that verse and the last verse in it. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Crowds of people amazed that Jesus could speak these things. They, they had heard of some of these before, but they never applied them that, that if you're angry with a brother, you could be guilty of murder. They never even thought this way because the teachers of the law never taught anything like that because they taught with hypocrisy because they were not poor in spirit. They were not mourning. They were not meek. They, weren't, they did not hunger and thirst for righteousness. They weren't merciful. They weren't pure in heart. They certainly weren't peacemakers. But they were the righteous, were they not? Were they not? Verse 29, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Where are we? Are we more like the Pharisees and religious leaders or are we like Jesus? Valid question. So I'm back to the title of my sermon. How are you building your life? Because each element of the body has to understand its purpose. To be jointly fit together to mind the head, which is Christ. To go out into this world and live differently. Many consider themselves brothers of Jesus. But does he consider you his brother or sister? This week you're going to read whatever chapters you're going to read, but I know you're going to read to Matthew chapter 12. I haven't looked yet. Just two chapters away. And Jesus has to say this at that point. Verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. As you read this week, and if you don't have a devotional, there's still some down here. They don't do any good sitting on the shelf. They do good in your hands reading them. Okay? Or maybe you want to give one to somebody. I can always get more of them if we need to. They sell them every day. So if somebody needs one, get one. As you read through the devotions, as you read through Matthew and wherever else, I guess we're going to keep on going to Kings. and probably going to 2 Kings, I think. Think about what Jesus is telling you to do. Not what he's telling you, but telling you what to do. Because it's easy to quote Scripture and say, love your enemy. It's hard to do it. It's impossible for me to do it. But all things are possible for God. He brought me to salvation when He called me. He will faithfully carry me to the end and finish the good work that He started in me. And I am the masterpiece, the workmanship that He has created before the beginning of time to do good works in Christ Jesus. So how am I building my life? Am I building them on Jesus Christ and nothing else? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you here. We thank you for the fellowship that we have not only with you and with the Son and with the Spirit, but the fellowship that we have with one another, that we are part of a family. 
Lord, help us to live like we are part of your family and, and to invite others into the kingdom by the way we preach and by the way we live. And Lord, we just can't wait until the day when all things are made new. We thank you for Jesus' finished work on the cross and help us to realize that the story is still being written through us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.